Hi again, friends. Welcome back to Doing Things on Purpose, the podcast that empowers women to take charge of their time, health, relationships, and money by doing things on purpose. I'm your host, Suri. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. So this week, I'm going to give my personal finance 101 lesson for moms on the basics of budgeting, saving, retirement planning, and wealth building. And why I say it's for moms is because I've tried to keep everything simple. You can always go deeper or optimize things as you go along, but I'm simply offering a place to start. You're more than welcome to join in the conversation by leaving a comment on my website at surishtahel.com forward slash 11 or sending in your questions to surishtahel at gmail.com. Before we begin, let's start with this week's mom check-in. How has your self-care been this week, my dear friends? I really hope it's been going well or better for you. Personally, I had some off days, but mostly I could get my morning yoga in. On top of my usual daily yoga practice, I added some light weights to my routine as my weak right arm was starting to act up again, and I do not want to spend money on physiotherapy just because of my laziness. Another self-care practice I've been meaning to do is to fill out a Judge Your Neighbor worksheet a day from Byron Katie, which I've miserably failed to do in the past week. I'll include a link to that in the show notes if you're interested, because it's really been a super helpful tool that's helped me so much to pass through any stressful or judgmental thoughts that are quite sticky just by writing it down and questioning it on paper. But that's a topic for another day. Second check-in question, have you had time to get your life a little more organized this week in terms of your schedule or the calendar on your phone? If not, come on, what are you waiting for? Your life will not just magically organize itself. Just start the habit of adding things to your calendar as events come in. It's my best tip to help ensure that you don't overextend and overbook yourself. I hope these check-ins help to support you in some way to feel more in control of your life. So let's get started on today's topic, which is Personal Finance 101 for Moms. Last week, I shared with you my philosophy about money, how it's just another tool that can help us support our loved ones, ourselves, and the causes that we care about. And this week, I promised I'd talk about the how of it. So let me start by sharing a little bit about myself and how we got started as a family when it comes to our money story. I come from a middle-class family in Malaysia, which is in Southeast Asia above Singapore. Both of my parents worked full-time jobs, and we were raised by a series of maids who lived with us, cooked and cleaned. In Malaysia, this was just what many normal middle- to upper-class families did because of the relatively cheap cost of labor. This lifestyle was sustainable to a point. In the modern Western world, though, this was not normal anymore. In Switzerland, where I now live, help at home is just for rich people. None of our friends have nannies or helpers living in their homes. It makes sense because labor is so much more expensive here. But even if it was affordable, I personally think it's a moot point because many parents in my generation, I'm a millennial or Generation Y, by the way, we've shifted our values. We prefer to be more hands-on when it comes to our families and our homes And we also value our privacy much more than the past generations. For me, this means that the new generation of parents who choose to stay at home need to think about their work at home as actual work. There are so many articles and group chats of parents wanting their work as stay-at-home moms and dads to be validated. But internally, as a generation, we parents are also still struggling ourselves with that feeling of not being enough and not valid in the work that we do. I think this is something we need to look at and work on to improve because every job that serves is valid. Every job that serves is valuable. 
As stay-at-home parents, we have to be willing to grow and learn the ropes on the job, just like we would be doing in a traditional workplace. We have to learn how to care for children, homemaking skills like cooking and cleaning, how to be respectful parents, how to work as a team with our spouses. Maybe it's taking turns putting the kids to bed or attending social gatherings in support of our partner's work. We need to learn how to nurture mutually supportive structures, whether it's through friends or family connections, organizing gatherings. We need to know how to manage our stress and stay healthy. We need to embrace experimentation and lifelong learning to have a thriving career again later on in life. And we also need to keep an eye on the financial health of our family. That's a lot on our plate, but it's also very exciting and meaningful work. So let's stop thinking about staying at home as just a pastime or a time out while waiting for the kids to grow up. Because if we don't pay attention, life happens to us, not for us. Let me give you an example. It must have been around 10 years ago in 2013 that we got a sum of money from my husband's parents as an advanced inheritance so he could buy in as partner in the company that he was working in at the time. Long story short, the plan didn't work out and my husband ended up changing jobs. And so we didn't need to use the money that was given to us. But a year and a half or so later, my husband was telling me about how frustrated he was that our savings account hadn't grown since the time we left Hong Kong and moved back to Switzerland. And I'm sure this is a very common problem with most new parents. But anyway, we realized that the balance was the same after three years or so of being back. And then I asked him, what happened to the money that your parents gave for the partnership? Shouldn't that at least have made our savings balance higher? But he didn't know. To be clear, I didn't, and I still don't blame him. It takes two to tango. We'd just been living our lives. We weren't particularly big spenders. On top of everyday expenses like buying kids clothes diapers, food, or going to the dentist once a year, we also went on holidays when we were stressed like anybody else. We ate out in restaurants every so often. We sometimes offered to pay for drinks or pick up the bill when we were with friends. We bought good clothes when something nice was on sale. We were generous with presents. We bought nicer furniture for our home. And I spent time and money obsessing over stainless steel pans, self-watering pots, and beautiful wooden cutting boards. I mean, when you earn quite well, what's the point if you can't enjoy it once in a while, right? Don't get me wrong. These were all nice things to have, and I don't regret most of the things we spent our money on. But what I've also learned over the years is that we need to put our money first according to our priorities and to be content with spending what we have left over or saving for the nice-to-have things that we want but don't need in our lives. As Paula Pant says, you can afford anything but not everything. So that's what made me wake up and realize that if one of us didn't get it together and make a plan for our money, we'd be in big trouble a few years down the road. And that's how we started thinking about the different things that our money has to pay for. We started opening sub-accounts to set aside money in specific buckets for specific purposes. The key word here is automation. We automate everything that we can. And that's how we've paid the bills, funded our holidays, which is a big value item for us, and how we've slowly grown our savings over time. So if you're a new mom, this is where I want you to focus your attention on this foundation piece. Because for me, automation allows me to plan a strategy once and let it run and work for me for years before I need to look at it or tweak my strategy again. And as a mom, you know how precious your time and attention is. Less time thinking about money because it's all taken care of equals more time thinking about other things in your life. So let's dive deeper into some real actionable points. The first thing I want you to focus on are the types of buckets you might need to prioritize to keep your family's expenses and savings in check. Here I've outlined 12 money buckets that we use as a family, but if you're just starting out and still uncomfortable discussing the topic of money with your spouse, just focus on the little wins. 
maybe just having that conversation can be a small win. Remember that new ideas often need time to rest and get processed before you or your spouse are finally ready to take action. But please take action, even if it's just one tiny step at a time. So here are my 12 money buckets. The first one is the salary account, a checking or current account with a debit card where the salary comes in. You probably already have this. The second one is the emergency savings account. This is preferably a high yield savings account without a debit card. Aim to slowly save up to six to 12 months of your monthly expenses in this account, if you're in the US, or up to three to six months of your monthly expenses if you live in Switzerland due to our more robust unemployment benefit system. Bucket number three, your spouse's expense account. That's you if you're the one who's staying at home. So open a separate partner account, which is a current account with a debit card for the spouse who's staying at home. Set up an automated transfer each month from the salary account to this account with an agreed upon sum for fun money. For a middle-class family like ours, this could be anywhere from 200 to 400 per month, depending on what you can afford. And this is to pay for things like hairdresser's appointments, a night out with your girlfriends, clothes, shoes, and other personal expenses. This will really help you pace out your spending. Bucket number four is a household expenses account. This is a checking or current account with its own debit card. Again, set up an automated transfer of an agreed upon sum from the current salary account into this groceries account. For instance, 1,000 to 1,500 per month and use it whenever you or your partner buy groceries, medicine, or pay for minor transportation costs as you go about your day. The fifth bucket is for housing payments, meaning your rent or your loan. Set automated payments for rent, water, and electricity to be paid the day after your salary comes in. As your biggest fixed cost, make sure your rent is less or not more than a third of your gross income. The sixth bucket is your credit card payments. Make a habit of always paying off your credit card fully each month. If you don't know if you are, just ask your partner. Spending more than you have is a recipe for disaster. If you already have credit card debt, keep the card at home and focus on paying off your debt steadily month by month. Bucket number seven is the taxes subaccount. Open a subaccount, which is a savings account basically with no debit card to save up for your taxes on a monthly basis. You can use last year's tax amount and divide it by 12 If you or your spouse got a raise or bonus, you can increase your tax allocation proportionately as well as a guesstimate to work with. Automatically transfer this amount each month from the current salary account into this taxes account the day after your salary comes in. The eighth bucket is the health insurance subaccount. Whether you have health insurance or you're funding your health care on a case-by-case basis, Set aside the amount required to keep your family protected in a separate sub-account. Bucket number nine is a holiday or dream bucket. Whether it's vacations, a house, a car, a monthly massage, or whatever else that gives you and your family a sense of enjoyment in life, set up a sub-account where you transfer monthly savings to fund that dream. Bucket number 10 is your employee retirement fund. If you or your partner's employer offers a retirement account with matching contribution, take advantage of that free money and contribute enough to your traditional or raw 401k if you're in the U.S. or in your Bevauge if you're in Switzerland to get the maximum company match. If you don't know what plan you're on, please don't be afraid to ask your employer for a copy of the contract. Bucket number 11 is your individual retirement fund. This is a tax-advantaged account, such as a traditional or Roth IRA if you're in the U.S., or the 3A third pillar account if you're Swiss. Some points to note. Because these accounts are tax-advantaged, there is a limit to how much you can save here per year. 
So for instance, in 2023, the annual maximum contribution amount is 6,500 in the US or 7,500 if you're 50 or older. In Switzerland, it is currently 7,056 per year for the 3A account. Divide the maximum yearly contribution allowed by 12 and automate payments from your salary account into your IRA or your 3A individual retirement account for Switzerland on a month by month basis. Individual retirement accounts can be opened within a bank or with a discount broker like Charles Schwab, Vanguard for the US, or VIAC, FinPension, and frankly, for Switzerland. If your individual retirement account is in a bank, please consider moving it to a discount broker in order to be able to access low-cost, passively managed index funds or ETFs, along with lower fees than what your bank offers. Lastly, consider how your retirement accounts will be taxed when you retire. The rules are different according to the different types of retirement accounts and by the country that you live in. And if you happen to live in Switzerland, my advice is to open multiple 3A accounts, typically up to five, with the same or different provider to help reduce your tax burden upon retirement. This is because individual 3A accounts have to be liquidated on a lump sum basis. So you'll pay less taxes when you stagger the withdrawal of this type of retirement account over time. There are two ways to do this. You could open a new account when your balance reaches 40,000 francs, or you could already open five 3A accounts in the beginning and fund it equally or alternately over the years. So the last bucket is your standard taxable brokerage account. This is your out of retirement investments. In Switzerland, this is part of your 3B assets. But no matter where you live, because there is a contribution limit to all tax advantage retirement accounts, if you can and want to save enough money to retire comfortably or to fund your child's education, you'll have to start thinking about saving and investing beyond your employee and individual retirement accounts. These are simply investment accounts in discount brokerages such as Vanguard, again, Schwab in the US, Interactive Brokers or DiGiro in Europe, or even robo-advisors such as Clever Circles in Switzerland. And by the way, many discount brokers also offer fairly priced robo-advisors, just ask. In these accounts, you can still invest in low-cost ETFs and index funds, which may give you an average return of 7-12% to over time. But this is also where you can consider taking a bit more risk, since you already have your nest egg safe and sound in your retirement accounts and your emergency savings accounts. Here is where I also think about investing in slightly riskier ETFs like blockchain technology, cybersecurity, or artificial intelligence or even in individual stocks of blue chip growth companies, such as Apple or Google, which can give me a larger average annual return, up to 30% or more annually. By the way, it's not about calculating your total capital and a 30% growth on top of that as your end number, but investing allows that seven or 30% average annual return to compound on itself over time, meaning you earn interest on top of your interests earned. And over time, that adds up exponentially. But if you're new to personal finance and investing, I don't want to go any further than that and confuse you. The important thing is to do these things step by step, baby steps, and just keep going. Just keep learning and do what's doable for you and your partner right now because honestly, it's a balancing act. Just like parenting and housekeeping, One spouse tends to lead a bit more in certain areas and then follows a bit more in other areas. In my opinion, just as women tend to be natural leaders when it comes to parenting, we are actually also natural leaders when it comes to personal finance and managing our family's financial well-being, but only if we choose to learn how to harness that knowledge and apply it in our lives. I know some of you might think, how can I manage money when I'm the spender in the family? But let me tell you something. When you know why you're saving your money, you have a strategy. The things or experiences you're saving for, the retirement goals you have in mind, the education or dreams you want to fund, 
And when you know the how of it, how to save, how to grow and compound your money over time, you'll automatically have less desire to browse every season for that new shoe, that new outfit, or that new hair treatment that you don't actually need. And you'll have more desire to find a way to make more money because you know the main purpose of your money. And don't get me wrong, you can still enjoy these treats. They make life worth living, but you do it more consciously and only with the money that you can afford to spend and not with the money that you don't actually have. So that's all I have for you this week. Remember, don't get overwhelmed. You can listen to this podcast again. Start with the first eight buckets and go from there. And by the way, just a quick side note, if you want to guesstimate how big of an investment portfolio you'll need to fund your retirement, assuming that you maintain your current lifestyle, then try multiplying your current yearly expenses by 25. You can find this and more tips on my 13 Money Lessons That Every Parent Should Know blog post at surishtahil.com forward slash money. And if you need a written copy of this episode to use as your checklist, check out the transcript at surishtahil.com forward slash 11. Thank you so much for tuning in. I believe in you. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share this podcast if you like it. This is Suri, and you're listening to the Doing Things on Purpose podcast, and I can't wait to catch you again next time.